Hi, everybody. I hope uh, I hope everybody's with us. Uh, it's nice to be here again. My name is Nat Paul, and I am the Director of Educator Support for OGEN, uh, the Ontario Justice Education Network. Um, <clears throat> you are here today because we have a wonderful session. Uh, today's session is called uh, Canada and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, Child Rights in Action. Um, and uh, we are supported here uh, by Justice for Children and Youth. And I'll get into a, a more specific introduction uh, of the folks of, who are speaking with us in a moment. Uh, for the first uh, thing, I'm just going to take a, a second and do some introductory stuff. So um, <clears throat> I'm on camera, but of course today's work or today's webinar represents the work of, uh, of, of many of my colleagues here. So I, uh, I would like to note uh, the contributions of Rara Cesara, uh, Zoe Paddock, Christy Pagnuti, who's here on camera, uh, and Michelle Thompson, who is working in the background, as well as the rest of the Summer Law Institute team for bringing us together here. So <clears throat> before uh, we get started, I uh, will say a couple of logistical things and housekeeping things. Um, we will uh, put links in the chat if there are any of them to be shared. Um, we are going to try and save questions and comments for the end. You can go ahead and, uh, and write your comments and questions into the chat or the Q&A function, uh, and then we'll deal with them at the end. And of course, the presentation is being recorded. So we will be posting this video and any supporting materials on our website uh, coming up. Uh, usually this takes us not more than you know, the, a week or so. Uh, so we do a land acknowledgement. Um, <clears throat> many of us are here or near or in Toronto, which is currently home to a large and diverse indigenous population. Uh, it's the traditional territory of the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation. Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Huron peoples, who are, of course, the original nations and stewards of this land. Um, stewardship, I think, is an important concept when we talk about children. Um, we acknowledge stewardship of land uh, as part of a commitment to remembering that land has always been a resource that is linked to power uh, and the power and ability of communities to shape the lives and destinies of their members. We're here to talk about Canada and justice and the rights of children. So it's important to remember that children uh, are literally where that destiny and membership uh, become embodied. Children are the only resource that is arguably more important than land for communities and continuity. And it's important to acknowledge that colonialism has explicitly been a project of seizing stewardship and erasing communities by severing both of these connections. Um, all human rights uh, in both the legal and sort of philosophical sense, including the rights of children, flow from a basic recognition of the universal and inherent dignity and worth of all people. So it's important to say uh, after a summer of announcement, after announcement of mass graves connected to residential schools, it underscores how little regard Canada has had for that dignity and reminds us how important it is to work so that all of our relations can thrive. It is a privilege to be here in this place and to do this work. So I will now introduce our panel. Uh, first, we are joined by Mary Birdsell, who uh, is the Executive Director for Justice for Children and Youth at JFCY. Mary's been a lawyer at JFCY uh, since her call in 1996. And uh, so for 25 years has been a tireless advocate for young people facing adversity. She's been active in all areas of the work, including direct, re direct representation of young people, test case litigation, public legal education, community development, systemic law reform, and mentoring and supporting child rights advocates. Um, and we are also joined by her colleague, Jane Stewart. Uh, Jane is a litigation lawyer at JFCY and is also an experienced and dedicated advocate who's passionate about assisting vulnerable young people in the promotion of youth and child rights. Jane has appeared at all levels of court in Ontario, as well as at the Supreme Court, uh, the Federal Court, and the Federal Court of Appeal. Following her call to the bar in 2010, Jane remained with the Department of Justice for several years before joining a boutique litigation firm uh, focusing on Aboriginal law and child welfare. So with that, I will get out of the way and I will leave our, uh, our audience to Jane and Mary. It's all yours, take it away, thank you. Hey, thanks so much, Nat. Um, I really appreciate uh, that introduction. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Um, and I think your, your comments um, in the territorial acknowledgement are a wonderful segue into the, the topics that we're gonna cover today. 
Um, so today's presentation is called Child Rights in Action, Canada and the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, so for our presentation today, um, I'm going to start with an introduction to Justice for Children and Youth, where Mary and I uh, both work, um, and then I'm, and, and some of the work that we do there. Um, I'm then going to go into some of the details about the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which I will refer to as the UNCRC throughout the, the presentation. Um, and some of the ways that the UNCRC has been used and applied uh, in Canada. Um, and then as sort of a, a case study or a bit of a, a thought experiment about how these rights play out in, uh, in a practical way, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the voting age debate um, and uh, some of the efforts to, to lower the voting age in Canada, um, including a project that JFCY is currently involved in. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to lots of questions and comments, which uh, which Nat will present at the end. But uh, but please do send them send them through. We're really interested to hear what you think. Okay, so Justice for Children and Youth is a child rights organization and a legal clinic. Um, we serve children and young people throughout the province of Ontario um, across a whole range of legal areas. So we are funded by Legal Aid Ontario as a specialty clinic. Um, and our mission is to advance and protect the legal rights and dignity of children and youth. Um, so we provide legal services directly to children and to young people, um, as well as the adults who support them. So we frequently get calls from, um, from other lawyers, from teachers, from guidance counselors, um, and from all sorts of service providers who, who work with children and young people. Um, we provide direct client representation um, in, in certain cases where um, the, the area of law falls within our, our bailiwick and uh, the, the young person meets our, our other eligibility criteria. Um, and we also engage in law reform activities, so advocating to governments um, and to, to other decision makers um, to have the rights of children recognized in various forum. Um, and we also do community development and public, public legal education work, uh, which is work like these types of presentations to, uh, to bring the ideas and um, important principles of, of children's rights to uh, to young people, to uh, people who support young people, uh, and to, in this case, teachers. Um, so some of the legal areas that we work in include youth criminal justice, um, education, health and mental health, uh, human rights, privacy, family law and child protection, um, victimization, uh, so where young people are the, the victim of a crime, um, homelessness, which pre presents many unique legal issues, um, housing, social and financial support, uh, immigration, and, and many more. Basically any area of the law in which a young person might uh, might face conflict or might come into contact with uh, with various social services or, or legal um, legal structures. Uh, that's where we work and that's where we can provide our services. Um, we are also home to a number of special programs, uh, which some of you might have heard about uh, in, in another session yesterday that was uh, presented by some of my colleagues. Um, so the first one is our, our Street Youth Legal Services Program. So this is a specialized uh, program for young people experiencing homelessness um, up to the age of 24. Um, so it's uh, special, as I said, specialized legal services for the unique circumstances of, of young people who are facing unstable housing or homelessness in our community. Uh, we're also recently now home to the Childhood Arrival Support and Advocacy Program, uh, which is a specific program um, assisting children and young people who may have come to Canada as, as young people from, from other countries, um, but are currently undocumented or without status or have precarious status. Uh, so the, the program is aimed at providing them with legal services and supports and advice um, to help them to access educational services and uh, in some cases to regularize their status. Uh, we've also are home to a, a special project um, called Enhancing Access to Special Education or EASE, uh, which is aimed at developing resources and tools for uh, parents and young people uh, navigating special education services in the education system. Um, so with that introduction, um, I'm going to turn now to the notion of children's rights um, and, and why should we care about the idea of children's rights. Um, so first, what are children's rights? Uh, well, children's rights are not 
necessarily a special category of rights. They are human rights. Um, and we start with a recognition that children are individuals and have the same entitlement to rights and to respect for their dignity as adults do. Um, so children are, are not property. They don't have to earn their entitlement to human rights. Um, they don't have to be good in order to exercise their rights um, or meet the expectations of adults. Um, their rights are fundamental um, and, uh, and are recognized uh, as such in, in all sorts of contexts. Um, they're not simply objects to be protected. Um, of course, young people often need the, the protection of adults, um, but this can't be accomplished without the recognition of their agency as, as individual rights holders as well. Um, and a child rights perspective, uh, from a child rights perspective, uh, recognizing the agency of young people and children is in fact protective. Um, it allows them to, to exercise their rights in meaningful ways, uh, to ensure that uh, you know, notwithstanding the fact that they are dependent on adults, um, they are developing, they're acquiring new capacities um, and are relatively immature, they're, they're in, their vulnerability as a result of their, their positions in society um, is, uh, is the reason why they're uh, entitled to, to the special protections that are provided by children's rights instruments, which we'll get into in, uh, in a moment. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what are the, what's the role of adult supporters in ensuring that children's rights are respected and protected? Um, so adults uh, hold sort of a special place because of the, the power that they have and, and the dependency that children have on them. Um, so adults have a role to educate children about their rights, um, to help to support and ensure the meaningful exercise of rights by children, um, to support their capacity and, and their evolving capacity. So as they, they grow and develop, they have a changing capacity for independent decision-making um, and to ensure that children are able to participate in decisions that affect them personally. Um, being an adult supporter of children's rights also means ensuring access to appropriate supports and resources um, and, and making sure that children have uh, access to those. Um, as well as identifying the, the needs that are most important to the child from the child's perspective and ensuring that those are, in particular, those are being supported. Um, I'd also note that professional duties uh, that apply elsewhere apply with equal rigor to, as between adults and children. Uh, so for example, as lawyers, our duties to our clients of confidentiality, of solicitor client privilege, of candor, of zealous advocacy, those all apply with equal force uh, to our child clients, notwithstanding the fact that they are minors. Okay, so then I want to turn specifically to the UNCRC, um, which is one of the, the child rights instruments that I mentioned. So this is one of the core human rights treaties of the United Nations. Um, it's an aspirational document and it, it articulates a common standard or a minimum standard, I would say, of uh, child rights protection and, and recognition. Um, it applies to all children under the age of 18 uh, worldwide um, and in, in countries where the, uh, the age of majority is uh, attained earlier, um, it's, yeah, it's still equally applicable to the child. Um, so the, the UNCRC is the most ratified human rights treaty uh, in the world. It's been ratified by every member state in the United Nations except one, the, the one holdout. Um, since 2015, it's only been one, uh, it's the United States. Um, and the, uh, the UNCRC sets out 54 articles um, that uh, set out children's rights and how governments and decision makers should work together to make sure that they're available to all children uh, and that they're recognized and supported uh, as, as robustly as possible. Um, and since 1989, children's rights have been enshrined in the UNCRC, and that was adopted by, uh, ratified by Canada, I should say, in uh, 1991. So more specifically, what's contained in the UNCRC? So it is a, it's a lengthy document that, as I said, sets out 54 articles, um, each of which identifies specific uh, articulations of rights for children. 
Um, so it recognizes that every child has basic fundamental rights, and these can include, or these do include, uh, life, survival, and development, uh, protection from violence, abuse, or neglect, and education that allows them to fulfill their potential, um, being raised by or having a relationship with their parents as far as possible, um, and having an opportunity to express their views and their opinions and to be listened to. The rights that are identified uh, in the UNCRC are recognized as being inherent, indivisible, interrelated, and interdependent. So what that means is that they're inherent in that they, they do not have to be earned, and they cannot be given or taken away. Um, and they're indivisible, interrelated, and interdependent, uh, which means that the, the realization of one set of rights requires the realization of others. So for example, the protection of children from violence uh, or abuse and neglect requires that children have ways to express their views and, and to ensure that they are being listened to. Um, so I've presented here a, a brief history of the UNCRC, which I won't go through in detail, but uh, which will be available to you in, in the materials after the presentation, um, which might be of interest. Um, but basically what this, this demonstrates is that there's been an evolving understanding of, hum of, of children's rights uh, throughout history, um, from special care and assistance um, under the Uni Universal Dec Declaration of Human Rights, um, to uh, rights to education, support, and health under the Declaration of the Rights of the Child. Um, and in 1989, uh, the adoption of the, the UNCRC sets out the minimum standards of rights for children uh, and provides robust recognition of uh, civil and political rights as well. Um, there's been ongoing effort to ensure recognition of rights by states parties uh, since the, the ratification of the UNCRC um, and to provide effective remedies for rights violations. So that means where uh, a right has been violated, there's a way to, to make it right. There's a way for a child to actually get a remedy for their violation of their rights. Um, so one way that happens is the optional protocol, um, which is a complaints procedure that's been created by the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, although Canada has still not ratified the optional protocol. Uh, so as I said, um, it's now 196 countries worldwide that have ratified the UNCRC, uh, the United States being the only holdout. Um, and the Committee on the Rights of the Child um, monitors uh, achievement of the, the rights that are protected by the UNCRC by publishing regular reports. Um, and uh, it also creates a, an opportunity, the UNCRC itself creates an opportunity for NGOs um, such as Save the Children or in Canada, um, also the Canadian uh, uh, CRCC. CCRC, um, which Mary will maybe help me out and uh, remind me what that stands for, but it's a uh, Child Rights Committee in, in Canada. Sorry, the Canadian Coalition on the Rights of the Child. That's right. Um, so the Canadian Coalition on the Rights of the Child, they also um, present what's called an, an alternative report, um, which is uh, reporting on Canada's uh, progress in, in achieving the, the sort of the aspirational aspects of the, the UNCRC. Uh, so again, Canada ratified it in 1991, and it has been uh, used and, and noted in, uh, in the law of Canada. Um, it has been specifically recognized by the Supreme Court of Canada as being the most universally accepted human rights uh, instrument in history. Um, so to do a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the, the fundamental principles of the UNCRC, um, as I said, the rights are considered to be interrelated and interdependent. Um, and the, what I presented here are the, the sort of the fundamental rights that are, are important to the achievement of all other rights. Um, so that includes the principle of, of non-discrimination under Article 2, uh, which holds that these rights apply equally to all children. Um, Article 3 sets out the best interests of the child as being a primary consideration in all actions, including children. So it must be um, taken into consideration by governments and decision makers where the rights of, child, uh, of children are at stake. Um, and I, I, interestingly, it's the only primary uh, consideration that's identified throughout the UNCRC. 
Um, they have a right to life, survival, and development, uh, and the right to express their views in, in matters that affect them. Um, and also a, a principle or, or theme that runs throughout the UNCRC is the respect for the evolving capacities for children as they grow and mature. Um, so the ability to act with agency or, or act with autonomy in matters that affect them. Um, so an example of this would be uh, in the healthcare context um, where young children are, are obviously would be dependent on their caregivers uh, to make treatment decisions for them. Uh, but over time, children acquire and develop the, the ability to, uh, to appreciate the risks and consequences of, of treatment decisions and to make independent decisions about their own care. Um, so then we'll do an even deeper dive into the principle of the best interests of the child, which is really fundamental to, to the UNCRC and is also one of the, the principles that's um, probably been, been most frequently incorporated into, uh, into Canada's domestic law. Um, so again, the UNCRC requires Canada to act in the best interests of children, um, which is the only primary consideration that's identified in the convention. Um, so what does it mean to act in the best interests of the child? So best interests are not separable from the other rights in the UNCRC. Um, and best interests um, are, are, they necessarily include uh, the recognition and that the recognition and exercise of children's rights are in their best interests. So that means that they can't be overridden by adults' uh, judgments of, of what might be best for the child in, in the circumstances. Um, and where adults are tasked with making decisions on children's, uh, on, the, on behalf of children, uh, they should do so in ways that protect and promote children's rights uh, and their options into the future. Um, so this principle has kind of a macro level application, uh, which means that states, uh, including governments and uh, legislatures, are required to integrate and apply the best interests of the child in every action and decision that they make, and that all policies and legislations that affect the, the rights or interests of children um, include a consideration of the best interests of the child uh, as the primary consideration, as a primary consideration. Um, it also has uh, micro level application. So there's the, um, the best interest of the child principle um, imposes obligations not only on states parties, but also um, on individuals. So it has uh, it has traction in the consideration of the circumstances of individual children um, and must be taken into account by uh, decision makers in individual cases as well. So for your reference, I've included some additional uh, provisions here, um, and I, I'd certainly encourage uh, everyone to go to the original document itself and, uh, and take a look at the, the rights that are enshrined there. Um, it really is comprehensive and, and covers um, basically any uh, decision making or any uh, circumstances that a child might encounter uh, as they grow and develop. Um, so there's a right to preservation of identity, um, including nationality, name, and family relations, um, a right to enjoy and practice culture um, with special considerations for minority and Indigenous children, a uh, right to education, a uh, right to achievement of the fullest potential, um, prevention of uh, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment while in detention, um, and detention must be used as, as only a last resort. Um, so we'll see that, that this sort of has a direct application in, in Canada's youth criminal justice laws as well. Um, and fundamentally a, a promotion of the, the dignity and worth of every child. Um, so the UNCRC is a, is a special document, it's a special instrument. Um, it's the first formal legal recognition of children's rights and the most widely ratified human rights treaty in history. Um, it recognizes children's rights as being fundamental human rights. They're not optional and they're not privileges to be earned. Um, it reaffirms that all children's, all rights are inherent, children's rights and, uh, and human rights generally are inherent and indivisible and interrelated. Um, and all of them are necessary for a child's full development. Um, it also creates mechanisms of accountability for states' parties um, and mechanisms to monitor their progress. Um, and it affirms the recognition of children's rights as an international norm. 
Um, and uh, it also highlights the role uh, that we all play at multiple levels, um, from societal to community to individual, um, to promote children's rights. Um, so the UNCRC has been incorporated into Canadian law in, uh, in several different ways. Um, so it has been directly incorporated into legislation, including, as I mentioned, the Youth Criminal Justice Act. Um, so this is the, the law that sets out all of the, uh, the rules and procedures for when young people are in contact with the criminal justice system. Um, and it's, it's specifically incorporated there. And um, interestingly, the, the YCJA very closely mirrors um, some of the supporting documents that have been developed under the UNCRC uh, called the Beijing Rules, um, which set out the, the minimum standards uh, for pre criminal justice um, worldwide. Um, it's also been um, incorporated into child welfare legislation. Uh, most recently in Ontario, it's, uh, it's been specifically incorporated into the preamble of the Child Youth and Family Services Act, um, where there's a recognition that um, children are individuals with rights to be respected and voices to be heard, um, and they're not simply uh, objects of adult decision making. Um, and there's also recognition uh, under various acts um, that uh, international human rights, the, the acts must be uh, uh, interpreted to, to be consistent with international human rights instruments to which Canada is signatory. So that would certainly include the UNCRC. Um, so in immigration decisions and uh, in other places where um, the UNCRC is incorporated, um, children must be equally and individually considered in decision making that affects their rights. Um, so there, there hasn't been um, broad incorporation of the UNCRC into legislation, um, which it may be sort of one of the, the barriers to its full implementation, uh, but notwithstanding the fact that it, uh, it's not uh, directly mentioned in legislation, um, Canada's legislation still needs to be interpreted uh, to be in compliance with it. Um, so it has been used in the case law uh, of numerous courts or, or used as an, an important interpretive tool for courts in understanding children's rights. Um, so I've given some, some examples here, of some cases from the Supreme Court of Canada, um, where the UNCRC has been specifically mentioned and, and used in, uh, in the decision making and in the reasoning of those decisions. Um, so for example, it was mentioned in DP and CS, which is a family law case um, which, uh, which states that the, the children's, be children's best interests are the sole criterion to be considered in parental custody and access cases uh, with direct reference to the UNCRC. Um, in the case of SHARP, um, which I did, I, I did reference earlier in the presentation, um, so this is the case where the court has recognized sort of the universality of children's rights as recognized in the UNCRC um, and specifically used it in interpreting um, the constitutionality of uh, child pornography legislation uh, and the, the right of children to be protected from harm, uh, particularly from sexual exploitation in that case. Um, the next case is, uh, is a case where JFCY was actually a, a public interest litigant, which means we brought the case to, to court ourselves um, and is, uh, it demonstrates the fact that despite the fact that the UNCRC has uh, very robust recognition of children's rights, it doesn't always prevent disappointing outcomes. Um, so in that case, uh, it was about corporal punishment of children uh, and JFCY argued that uh, you know, basically um, allow, the law that allows corporal punishment of children is, um, is unequal and unjust and uh, allows assault of children because they are children where assault would not be allowed for, uh, for an adult. Um, but unfortunately, the court upheld the law uh, and sort of created a, a, a test that uh, allowed the law to continue as it was. Um, but if, maybe we should query with our uh, our evolving understanding of human of children's rights, whether the moment might be right to, uh, to bring the case back to the court for further consideration. Um, another example is DB, um, which deals with the rights of children in the criminal justice system um, and enshrined in the law, the principle of diminished moral blameworthiness. So that children, because of their 
vulnerability, because of their evolving capacities, because of their relative immaturity, um, have diminished moral culpability for criminal uh, activities. Uh, and therefore, the, the focus of the, these criminal justice systems is really on rehabilitation and, and reintegration uh, of, of children who are accused of crimes. Um, and uh, another example is CP, uh, again, another example where uh, robust recognition of children's rights doesn't always lead to the outcomes that we hope it does. Um, and this is a case about young people's rights to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, um, where young people face an additional hurdle um, of getting uh, their appeals heard in the Supreme Court of Canada that adults don't face. Um, and the, the court upheld that as, as being constitutional. Uh, despite the, the obvious um, inequality in, in those provisions. Um, so another example of how the UNCRC uh, is an important interpretive tool uh, in Canadian law uh, is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms itself, uh, which is presumed to provide at least as much rights protection as inter international human rights instruments, including the UNCRC. Um, so this is a principle that's been developed in Canadian law by the Supreme Court of Canada um, and means that the principles of the UNCRC are important principles for understanding the rights and freedoms that are protected by the Canadian Charter. So from there, I'm going to move to uh, a practical example of how these rights may be sort of put into action or, or how they, they have a practical effect uh, in, in some of the uh, policies and laws that are, are developed in, in place in Canada. Uh, and that example is the debate around lowering the voting age. Uh, and the fundamental question here is, should people who are 16 be able to vote? Um, so there has been some discussion um, and, and it's gained some traction uh, in recent years that children who are 16 rather than 18 should be allowed to vote. Um, so this part or this module um, might be sort of an interesting basis for discussion in, uh, in your law classes. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the, the children's rights principles and the arguments for and against uh, in this section of the presentation. So the right to participate um, is part of the UNCRC under Article 12, which allows children the right to express their views freely in all matters affecting them. Um, and uh, their views have to be given due weight in accordance with their, their age and their maturity. So this isn't a, a uh, sort of a express right to participate, um, but it is often interpreted like that. Um, and so this can be uh, one of the sort of the principles or, or the child rights arguments in favor of lowering the voting age. Um, so in Canada, to, to challenge a law as being um, unfair or as being uh, improper, um, your recourse is um, to the Constitution and the Charter. So the Constitution and the Charter um, set out kind of the, the minimum rules or the, the rules that all legislatures and, and the parliament have to follow when they make laws. Um, so laws can be tested um, based on their compliance with, uh, with the guarantees and the rights set out in the, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So specifically, Section 3 sets out that every individual or every citizen of Canada has the right to vote in an election of members of the House of Commons or a legislative assembly and to be qualified for membership therein. Uh, so that would seem to suggest that uh, every citizen, regardless of age, would have the right to vote. Um, and Section 15 of the Charter sets out that every individual is equal before the law, uh, before and under the law, and has the right to equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination, uh, and specifically without discrimination on the basis of age. So again, this would, this would suggest that age can't be used as a reason uh, not to allow uh, children and young people to participate in elections. 
Um, but of course, we know that uh, the rights and the freedoms that are set out in the Charter aren't absolute, um, and they are subject to reasonable limits, as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. Um, so the question there is, that that raises for us is the restriction on voting to people over the age of 18 a reasonable limit on young people's right to vote. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the evolution of the right to vote in Canada and, and internationally. Um, so the right to vote has been part and parcel of the recognition of the rights and dignity of, of particular, uh, particular groups throughout history. Um, so for example, First Nations, uh, Inuit, MAT people um, have been granted the right to vote as their, their rights and their dignity and uh, equality has been uh, recognized more generally throughout the history of Canada. Um, women, uh, particular uh, racialized groups and religious groups have all at various times been granted the franchise. Um, inmates uh, are now allowed to vote. Uh, the, the ban on prisoners voting was deemed unconstitutional. Um, people with mental disabilities uh, were previously excluded from voting uh, until as recently as 1993 uh, and now have been given the right to vote or their right to vote has been recognized. Um, and uh, there have been various changes that have happened throughout history relating to age. Um, so voting was extended to men in the armed services under the age of 21 in 1917 uh, and was lowered generally from the age of 21 to 18 in 1970. Um, so the, we can query whether our evolving understanding of children's rights, um, similar to our evolving recognition of the rights of, of various uh, vulnerable groups or marginalized groups, um, does that mean that the voting age should further be lowered? Um, so this is a, a debate that has happened and is happening worldwide. Um, so I, again, I'm not going to review this history in detail, um, but suffice to say that many democracies have uh, historically lowered the voting age. It was lowered from 18 to 16 in Brazil, for example. Um, it was set at 16 in South Africa. Um, notably during World War II, uh, the voting age was lowered from 21 to 18. Um, the rationale being that if you're old enough to be conscripted into the army, uh, you're also old enough to, to participate in public affairs by voting. Um, there have been previous pr proposals to lower the voting age in Canada, um, specifically one in, in the last uh, bullet point there. Um, there's a new campaign that's been launched, um, as well as a previous proposal in 2005, uh, but those proposals were not adopted. So internationally, about a dozen countries allow citizens to vote at the age of 16, um, sometimes with conditions, um, and those include Scotland and Wales, who um, have a lot in common with our own legal traditions. Um, and the level of interest in the voting age and this debate is high, uh, partly driven by the fact that young people have greater access to media in order to engage with um, and be informed with public issues and, and issues that are of importance to them in particular. Um, so these are, despite the fact that Canadians under the age of 18 are prohibited to vote, um, here are some examples of, of countries with lower voting ages. Um, so certainly uh, the debate around the voting age and lowering the voting age uh, is not unique in Canada and, and has been recognized and adopted in, in other countries around the world. Okay, so it is an ongoing debate. Um, so I'm going to review some of the, the arguments for and for and against. Um, the most common argument against lowering the age is that teenagers just aren't mature enough and, and aren't capable of making political decisions. Um, 
some of the, the feedback that we've heard is that they don't even pay for their own cell phones, they don't pay for groceries, they don't pay rent. Um, how can they have opinions about, uh, about public affairs or about uh, the way the government should run? Um, their brains aren't developed enough, they're just not mature, uh, they don't have the knowledge or the capacity to make good political decisions. Um, and sort of in it, the most basic way, have you met a 16 year old? Um, and, you know, so we, we hear a lot of opposition based on uh, assumptions that people have based on the own, their, their, their own teenagers or they, the young people in their own lives. Um, and, uh, you know, the sort of the decision making capacity or lack of capacity that they may perceive in, in those young people. Um, there is suggestion in in uh, social science and in neuroscience, the brain is simply not developed enough to allow for this type of decision making um, and to make reasonable decisions in politics. Um, and another interesting uh, point of opposition is that many children are still living at home with their parents and would be influenced by the voting choices of their parents. Um, but of course, we're all influenced by others uh, in many, many ways. Uh, so in response, some of the arguments for, um, so research shows us that early voting predicts ongoing democratic engagement. So uh, the younger people start voting, the more likely they are to continue voting and to be engaged in democratic process and, and in, the, in, in civil society. 16-year-olds um, are still very much engaged in the, the education system, um, and therefore there's, there's access to education and, and to ways to inform 16-year-olds uh, that will help them to make appropriate decisions or, or come to reasonable political decisions. Um, and if you're a full participant in society, then you should be allowed to vote. Um, some further arguments for that 16 year olds right now will be the ones who live with the consequences of the choices that adults make. Um, this sort of puts me in mind of a, a, an editorial I read earlier today, uh, in fact, about uh, where uh, Greta Thunberg and some other young people uh, identified the climate crisis as being a children's rights crisis. Um, and uh, I think that's that's a pretty stark example of, of how young people will have to deal with the consequences of decisions that are being made now. Um, there's also science on the other side. Um, so I previously mentioned uh, the science that suggests that young people's brains are still developing. Um, but this science uh, on the other side seems to suggest that um, despite the fact that certain faculties are still developing, uh, young people at the age of 16 um, do actually have the capacity to, to form the types of decisions uh, or types of opinions that are required to make uh, reasonable choices in voting. Um, they also have the capacity to, to hold independent and critical views um, that may not align with, with those of the adults in their lives. So from a children's rights perspective, um, sort of putting this in, in the language of, uh, of the law and of the UNCRC, um, again, the actions or inactions of government uh, now will impact children more strongly than they will than any other group in society. Um, and that many changes in society have a disproportionate and often negative impact on children uh, that, that may not be well recognized. Um, and the healthy development of children is obviously crucial to the future well-being of any society. Uh, and children do have that recognized right to be heard and considered and uh, have meaning and meaningfully participate uh, in decision-making processes, uh, which we would suggest includes the political process. So the, the research does show that adolescents under the age of 18 have the cognitive capacity necessary to vote. Um, and that young people have the ability to articulate their beliefs uh, and to make voting decisions uh, appropriate to their preferences. So they know what they, they want, they know what they prefer, uh, and can identify the, uh, the candidates that are, are best able to, to promote those preferences. Um, and it was also found interesting that their knowledge of the political process was not significantly different than those in older age groups, uh, but their trust in democracy and their willingness to participate in the process were actually much higher. Uh, 
Um, so while there is still uh, ongoing brain development that happens into the mid 20s, um, this isn't inconsistent with giving social responsibility to young people. Um, and certainly 16 year olds, um, there are certain social responsibilities in, in many, many other contexts. Uh, so for example, they're able to enroll in the military. Um, they can be a sentenced as an adult in, in court. Uh, they are able to legally consent to sexual activity. Uh, they can hold a driver's license. They do pay taxes, um, and they are actually able to vote in the political party elections of, uh, of individual political parties. Um, so just uh, by way of conclusion, um, there, there is a, a movement underway to potentially further lower the voting age from, from 21 to 18 and now to 16. Um, there's a number of youth advocacy organizations, lawyers and law students, uh, considering uh, a challenge to the Elections Act under the Canadian Charter uh, and including some of the principles of the UNCRC that we've discussed uh, in order to lower the voting age. Um, and there's also currently a bill before the Senate um, to lower the voting age as well. Uh, and just uh, a plug for JFCY, we are one of the, the youth advocacy organizations involved in this movement. Um, so I think we've got about 10 minutes left. So with that, I'm going to, to open it up. Um, I hope that there's some comments and some questions in the chat, uh, and we'd be happy to take any of your questions now. Um, and I'd really actually be very interested to hear what, what uh, people think about the voting age debate as well. Maybe I'll, I'll just jump in sort of to get us started. Um, I'm just going to go to, sorry, back in the chat, Joletta uh, put a question in the chat, but I think it probably only came um, to, to the panelists. I think that's partly how the, how the setup works. Uh, so I'll just read what she said because she puts the question really out, back to, out to everybody. Uh, lowering the voting age to 16 is regularly debated topic in civics class. Even after, after having the CCLA, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, in to discuss human rights, most youth truly believe that 16 is too young. They believe that most youth would not be informed about issues and would vote with their peers, if at all. Anyone have a different perspective? Um, so maybe I'll jump in uh, sort of to respond to this. As, as Jane mentioned, um, Justice for Children and Youth is working with a number of different organizations and a number of young people who are going to bring a charter challenge against the, uh, the restriction to 18 of the voting age. Um, and in fact, the current, you know, the question is still open about, is it a, really a question of lowering it to 16 or is it possibly uh, a question of making it even lower than that? Um, there are countries where, where there are uh, lots of ways in which children as young as 14 can participate in democratic processes. And actually Canada is one of those places because in Canada, uh, you need to be 14 years old to join a political party and to participate in uh, voting for the leader of that party. So 14 year olds in Canada can vote for the leader of the party and yet they're excluded from then participating uh, in general elections uh, um, to vote for members of parliament or members of the legislature. Uh, so one of the things that I would say that is that in, in, a, in a number of our consultations and there actually is research about what teenagers think about this, um, and one of the things that we have experienced is that when you're talking to young people, there is a divergence of opinion where young people will say things like, oh my gosh, my friends are not mature enough to vote, they should not be allowed to vote. Um, but often these conversations really evolve so that when you talk a little bit more about what are they concerned about, what are the sort of overriding rules um, uh, you know, when it comes to voting, what do, what do we think voting requires of people? Uh, so you can ask sort of some of the challenging questions like, you know, well, is it just your age that makes you responsible to vote? You know, are all adult voters responsible and thoughtful about their voting or do they just go with their peers as well? Um, and so I think there is lots of fodder for very interesting conversation. Um, some of the social science research shows that, um, 
that teenagers are split sort of half and half about whether teenagers should vote on a cold question. But if you ask the question in a more uh, comprehensive discussion about um, some of the brain science in terms of cognition capacity of teenagers and other things that you really get much higher uh, higher levels of, of agreement about the idea that teenagers should vote like in the 70, 75, 80% range. Um, so, but it is an interesting question about whether teenagers think that other teenagers should be allowed to vote. Um, and one of the things that I sometimes say is that I'm not sure that lots of my peers really should be responsible to vote either. So I'm not sure that it's really just an age uh, question. Um, yeah, so, I, so a few people are commenting about this question of whether or not your brain is fully developed. Um, and, uh, you know, in the interest of trying to be very fair, we included that there are some social sciences, scientists who, uh, who say that, you know, because there is brain development that's ongoing into your mid 20s, uh, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't be thinking about vote, lowering the voting age, um, but the neurobio the neurobiological scientists really are pretty universal in their description that brain development, cognitive development, uh, really evolves over time, right from birth, and that many many things evolve in ways. That uh, So for instance, one of the things they say is that three and four year olds actually understand in very similar ways that adults understand the difference between telling the truth and telling a lie. Um, so that, you know, we have cognitive capacities that come on board as we grow. And that, uh, as Jane mentioned, the, the cognitive capacity that people use to make like decisions where you have time to think, time to process and time to information gather that's voting, um, really that those kinds of, of cognitive skills come on board between you know, 12 to 14. Uh, so that by the time people are, are 16 years old, they actually make decisions in very much the same ways uh, as, as adults do. Um, and that the things that develop that, that uh, executive function kind of thing are really more relevant to uh, impulsive kinds of decisions and other things. Um, anyway, I probably talked too much about that part. Um, no, I, I, I don't think you've talked too much about it, and I, and I certainly don't hear anybody making an argument for raising the voting age based on the exact same logic. Um, so this is great. We've got a, a lot of, uh, of activity and questions to go through, so I'm just going to try and sort through some of them. Um, okay, so let's see here. Uh, okay, okay, so here's one. Okay, right. Somebody's clearly been on the website and they've asked uh, uh, what's happened to your your rights cards. Do you remember the, uh, the the rights cards that you guys used to have? You'd be able to hand out. Are those still available? Teachers used to love those. They are still available and uh, and we, we do have lots of them. We have fewer requests for them in, in more recent years and obviously during the pandemic. Uh, all of that kind of stuff is really dried up, but no, we have lots of them available and uh, we still do send them out. Great. And if anybody's interested, you can get in touch with us and we can we can sort of help make that. I'm fairly sure we've got a bunch of them back in the office that I haven't been to since March of 2020 as well. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then what else we have here? Oh, this is interesting as well. Um, so there's a number of there's a number of questions that in in one way or another, uh, deal with questions of enforcement. Uh, and so one question is like, to what extent is the, is, is being a signatory binding? Is there anything that sort of, that helps to sort of enforce that? Uh, and then as a sort of related question, another one is, uh, are you aware of any measures that have been or could be taken to build a more robust enforcement mechanism into, uh, children's rights, which I mean is, of course, this is a question surrounding any international law, I guess. Um, maybe I'll start and, and Mary, feel free to jump in. Um, so uh, 
generally the, the position that states take are around international law that until it has been actually specifically incorporated in domestic legislation, it doesn't sort of um, place sort of, uh, I think, hard and fast uh, obligations on, on individuals. Um, but I would say that that having ratified the, the legislation and it has, or the, the, uh, the UNCRC and incorporating it into some legislation um, and I, I would take a, a different view that uh, that it's not necessary to have specifically ratified it into domestic legislation in order for those obligations to uh, to carry weight and to have force uh, within Canada. They, you know, they are obligations and in some ways they are also aspirations uh, for Canada. So um, you know, certainly the feedback that we've we've gotten from the Committee on the Rights of the Child is that um, we are falling short in certain ways and uh, you know, that there has been direction that, that Canada needs to improve its uh, uh, protection of children's rights in, in certain significant ways. Um, so it's it's not just guidelines, it is binding international law, but sort of ensuring that it's it's interpreted as being binding in Canada is, is sort of, that's that's the rub, that's the, the difficult part uh, in some ways. Um, I mean, certainly if Canada were to adopt the, the optional protocol, uh, which allows a, a complaints mechanism to, to, inter, to the international body, uh, would be a way of uh, protecting children's rights in a more robust way. Um, although from sort of a, a access to justice type of, of perspective, um, that's a difficult thing to do. So that, uh, you know, that itself is not, uh, is not sort of the uh, the silver bullet or the, the solution to building more robust uh, recognition or, or enforcement of children's rights. Um, and I would say a lot of the uh, of ensuring that children's rights are protected and, and enforced um, does fall in some to some extent to the adult supporters of, of young people. Yeah, I, I would just echo that, um, you know, Children's rights organizations continue to call on Canada to rat or not to ratify. We've already ratified for many years, but to incorporate the UNCRC into domestic or legislation, enshrine it into uh, domestic legislation by making it its own act of Parliament or the legislature. Um, having said that, you know Jane talked about that um, the the Youth Criminal Justice Act and in Ontario, the Child Youth and Family Services Act make specific reference to the UNCRC and the importance of the rights therein. And so the courts have really used that to say, okay, well, in this context, then the UNCRC applies. Um, I would also say that, you know, over the last 20 years or so, as human rights instruments have matured and our jurisprudence around um, human rights and, and charter rights and charter protections have matured, um, I think there really is a, a very clear message that is unequivocal from the courts, the high courts, that um, these will be used as interpretive tools. So when you have the UNCRC and you're talking about children's rights in the court, I think you know, it's, it goes without saying that it has um, an influence on how people are to think about, about, uh, about rights. Um, and I know one of the things that Jane did mention as well that, that can be useful even in the context of teaching and other kinds of disciplines where we work with children, um, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and their general comments really have very instructive things to say about what children's rights mean uh, sort of when the rubber hits the road. Um, so if you're interested in, in looking at, you know, things in a more deep way, uh, I refer you to the general comments and, and there's lots of interesting fodder for discussion there. Thank you. Um, okay, so moving along then. Uh, oh, this is a good one too. So uh, there's all this gray area. Uh, and so somebody is asking, uh, are you aware of any sort of special standards or exceptions um, that uh, apply to children who may or may not be involved in armed conflict? So this person is thinking of Omer Cotter um, and how, what the legal framework was that allowed a child to be imprisoned in that way? Or is it just that they just did it? Yeah, so I mean, that's such a big, huge discussion and so much opportunity for really interesting commentary there. I'll try and be very, very succinct and say yeah. that, um, you know, that the United States argued that Omar Cotter wasn't a child soldier, 
but I don't think there's really any basis, you know, I don't think there's a child rights uh, student or, or scholar in the world who would suggest that he wasn't a child, child soldier, he was. Um, and so his detention at Guantanamo Bay um, by the Americans was just one, you know, that, that they just did it. Um, and some of the way in which Canada has treated him uh, on his return to Canada is, uh, you know, we were involved in one of the cases that, that uh, addressed some of his legal rights issues. Um, and I think my own view, my personal view, is that really it was just a political decision that for whatever reason the Canadian government didn't feel uh, brave enough, if I can be so rude <laughs> as to say, didn't feel brave enough to really stand up and, uh, and acknowledge that his rights as a child um, should have had a central place in how he was treated. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of something that somebody else once said, which is that human rights are not a popularity contest. Uh, they sort of, they attach to, to, you know, to everybody. And in this case, maybe some of that was a bit of a popularity contest. Um, I think uh, there's, we have a few more questions. Are, are you, are you okay with taking a, a couple of minutes extra? Okay. Sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, so here's one, uh, the spanking case. Uh, so the spanking case clearly, um, you know, uh, Sorry, I've lost it here. Um, oh, the spanking case clearly permits age discrimination contrary to Section 15 of the Charter. Um, so, I, I, how was that uh, worked around? Is the question. Like, how how was the how did the courts work around that? Was it a was it a was it an Oaks uh, test? Um, so, I uh, I'm sure Mary will correct me, uh, but. Um... I, I believe the court's analysis was that this actually um, wasn't discrimination, that it was actually um, sort of commensurate or consonant with uh, the needs of children, that this is an appropriate way for adults to, to discipline children. Um, and, you know, that's, so I, I mentioned they set out sort of a what I would view as being kind of an unworkable test or, or parameters for when corporal punishment can be used and it's not to be used out of anger and you know, right. it's supposed to hit them on the head and you know all of these sorts of exceptions. Um, but they, they actually found that this was actually um, not discriminatory because it, uh, it actually corresponds to the, the needs and circumstances of, of children um, and, and, uh, family. and, and families. Yeah. All right. That's, I um, think one of the things that, that lawyers love to talk about is, especially with respect to Section 15 and Section 7, um, that the, the substantive charter right and the Oaks test, the Section 1 balancing, often gets very uh, mushy, so mushy that there isn't even a middle anymore. Um, and I think this is one of the cases where there's really good fodder for that discussion about, you know, were the judges really... Um, sort of true to the idea of a substantive right that then could be curtailed by a reasonable limit, um, or did they just sort of incorporate their own sense of what should be a reasonable limit into the substantive um, analysis? Uh, so obviously we had a particular view about how that happened. Um, and uh, just to sort of uh, expand on uh, the, the case, um, I mean, there is lots of social science research that continues to come out about the negative impact of, of corporal punishment on children that, um, you know, in fact, it's not instructive, it's not a, a sort of an effective or appropriate um, disciplinary tool that um, it in fact does have have really detrimental effects on on children. So um, you know, maybe with that sort of factual background, it might be the moment to, to take the question back to the court. Um, you know, and hopefully our evolved understanding of, of children's rights would also potentially sway the court to uh, to come to a different conclusion. Thank you. That's a great answer. Uh, so just a couple more sort of practical things here. Somebody we have with us, uh, somebody who's working as a social worker, um, and they have asked uh, what kinds of things uh, they can do to help protect somebody from the influence of their parents if they're under the, if they're, if they're 16 or younger. Um, uh, so maybe actually if, uh, if you, I, I think that's the question, how can you protect 16 year old from influence from parents or others when they're still under their custody. So if a 16 year old is in a, is in a problematic situation, is there any mechanism that a social worker might look to 
to help alleviate that. Yeah, so I, I saw the question uh, in the Q&A and, and, and I'm not entirely sure whether it was related to the voting question or not. So I'm gonna, so. you don't think so? Okay. Um, so uh, I, I'll let Jane take this over because I actually um, am going to have to step off shortly. But uh, I think that um, if you are concerned that a young person is in some kind of danger or is in some kind of harm, then obviously you have a duty to report. Um, and uh, and so the, the Children's Aid Society pieces are, are at play there. Um, if your concern is much more generalized in terms of, um, you know, that you feel for some reason that the family uh, members might be having an, uh, a, an unsafe or an unhealthy or a worrisome influence um, just on the thinking of that young person, um, then I would say that that's one of the reasons that school and other community-based uh, um, sort of organizations and, and uh, places where children and teenagers gather um, can be so important because they're um, exposed in that way to the marketplace of ideas <laughs> um, or, you know, and certainly exposed to a variety of other, um, right, sorry, I'm just seeing the, the chat, a uh, variety of other views and, and, and positions. So somebody's raising the question of how the, you know, vaccine questions around vaccination are. So you might have a young person who's who's very influenced by their family members who are very fearful, who are, don't uh, don't subscribe to the science around vaccinations. Um, and I think just being engaged in school, being engaged in community organizations are places where young people have the opportunity to find out that other people may have different opinions and, and start to to develop and nurture their own views um, about things. I mean, there's a lot to say there. Those are big questions. <laughs> um, no, that that's that's super. So the the, the social worker has said that he he actually did mean uh, something about voting, but I think you actually touched on that with the second half of it anyway. Um, I'm just cognizant now of time. We're about ten minutes over, and Mary, you 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 said you need to go. So I think that uh, at this point, I'm going to just say uh, to our panelists. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for this. This was super. I am going to just quickly drop uh, a feedback form link in the chat. So if people in the audience are inclined or have a moment to do that, it would be really, really helpful for us if we get some of the feedback from you on your session. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I will just uh, ask people to keep an eye on what's coming up. We do have uh, sessions on uh, becoming a paralegal on the top five, on what's new from OGEN uh, and on uh, anti-black racism in schools coming next week. So uh, those are those are all Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, good stuff coming. Uh, and with that, I will just say thanks to everybody for attending. This was great. Um, Mary and Jane, uh, if, you, if you're able to hang on just for a moment as people uh, drop off, that'd be great. Uh, but I'll just say goodbye uh, and thanks again to everybody. Thanks so much, Nat. It's uh, it's great to be involved. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. <laughs>